So, we're here to talk about the new X. Um, another entry in Buzzword Bingo Land. Um, and the, a problem that I've often had with, oh, who, who is kind of familiar, feels familiar with the term? A couple? Okay, who, who is actually trying to do it? Okay, you guys might be a little bit bored by this, so I really won't take offense if, if, you, if you go. Um, so, to kind of explain where Lean UX kind of sits in, in the kind of agile Lean continuum of stuff, um, I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of an origin story. And this is also kind of a slightly personal origin story as well. Um, so, um, hopefully, it will make sense. UX, first of all, as a term, um, is actually relatively recent, um, if you're old, I mean. Um, kind of in the kind of way that it's used now as, as, as a term to describe like a role position or an activity, um, it, it really goes back to 93, which is um, this guy, the, the, the great Don Norman, um, when he worked at Apple. And this is some meeting notes from 1993. And Don Norman's old job was user information architect, and it changed to user experience architect, UEA. They were doing proper acronyms then, though the, the letter started with the the letter at the start of the word. And this is, this is why he talked about doing it. It was because kind of user interface was too narrow a term for the kind of work that, that he did. He, he managed lots of different people doing lots of different things around industrial design and visual design and user interface design. Uh, interaction, I mean, interaction design as a term wasn't around then, but both, lots of different things. So he wanted a nice broad label to apply all of that. And interesting, at this point as well, it was very much a job title. You know, he was the user experience architect. He was the person leading that work rather than necessarily the person doing all of that work himself. A bit later on, 2000-ish, um, you had uh, this guy, Jesse James Garrett, who drew this diagram, which the UX people in the audience will have seen t a tedious number of times before. Um, we started talking about the, the kind of the elements that go into building a good user experience for the, the, the people who use your product. So here, user experience is much more of a term around the kind of the ideal that you're aiming for. You're trying to build a great user experience and kind of looking at the elements that went into that. And he divided it into two sides. This was around kind of web as software, web apps these days. This was around kind of web as content sort of this side, but it really went from kind of very abstract at the bottom to very concrete at the top. So at the bottom you're talking about user needs, then you're talking about kind of requirements, then you're talking about practices like interaction design, information design, um, stuff that probably sit under content strategy these days around how you organize those things and kind of, you know, the, the nitty gritty detail of the UI design, the interface design, the visual design at the top. So this is kind of user needs, early stuff tends to be later stuff, very abstract at the bottom, very concrete at the top. Oh yes, the slides you will have a copy of. Um, I've already been nagged to email it to the organisers already, so it should sorry, be there. Sorry. That's quite all right, it's a very sensible question. I, us I usually say that at the front, but I forgot. Now the interesting thing for me about this, and this, this is probably the most popular diagram to describe UX, but the interesting thing I find about this diagram is the small print at the bottom, which no one ever reads. This is the small print at the bottom. And this is the bit I find most interesting about that small print. Doesn't describe a development process, doesn't describe roles. Okay, it's talking about the things, the activities that go into user experience, not necessarily how you do it, and not necessarily who does it. And yet, in the UX world, this is often very cut into roles. You know, visual designers do visual design, user researchers do user research, interaction designers and UI designers do this in the middle. It's very kind of role definition type stuff. It's very similar to that kind of, you know, programmers program, testers test, DBAs do DBA stuff. And you often see diagrams like this, which are which are interesting in, in two different ways. One this is a diagram from the 
design society in the UK, you get similar stuff out of like the, the D school design in Stanford and lots of other places where you kind of start up in discovery mode where you're kind of the, the width here is meant to be the, the height rather is the kind of the number of options you're exploring. So you kind of start here it's you know your your rough problem space and you're looking at many options and then you're narrowing down those options to a kind of you know a brief of some kind and then you're building prototypes and exploring prototypes and then narrowing down to the final delivery. And this is like a relatively common way that people talk about the design process and it's again it's very waterfalling how it's often done. You know you get specialists at this end doing the user research you know, who then kind of go off by them. Some, sometimes companies hire completely other companies to go do this work. They go out, do kind of ethnography, talk to the users, do some prototyping, try out different ideas, come up with them, and then, oh, look, then they deliver something. <laughs> and then someone else gets over and starts developing it. It's, it's a very structured thing. And I kind of fell over into UX from development, as it were. I'm about half development, half UX in my skill set. And at this point, which is still kind of the late 90s, this is, this is the model that I'm working in, doing lots of kind of user research up front and then delivering documents and specifications to someone else or at the very least kind of there's, there's a stage where we kind of write it all up into this is what we're going to build and then we start building it. So, the late 90s. Um, dot com, but who's old enough to have worked in the dot com bubble? Wasn't it fun? <laughs> <laughs> um, I worked for numerous startups. They all failed miserably. Every single one of them. Um, and that was a common experience. Most of the work that people did. Um, built things that didn't work, and we spent an enormous amount of money building things that didn't work, because we had that big, very big model. We either, if UX was involved at all, it was in a big phase at the start, um, there was big requirements documents, there was the kind of pitches to investors to get the enormous chunk of money to build some stuff, um, then you build it, then you spend a lot of money launching it, and like three people use it, and you die a horrible death. <laughs> that happened several times to me. <laughs> It was fun. You learnt a lot, um, but didn't actually produce a lot of useful things. Now, it's enough of me talking for a bit. What I'd like you to do is, is briefly, amongst yourselves, in, in the row, I know this isn't terribly well organised for this, you might have to shout a little bit. Um, try and, um, you've, hopefully you've, you've still remembered that startup idea you started at the start. So I'd like you to try and come up with a, f a few options for what that might be and just write a sentence or two down around um, how you describe that to someone else. So it doesn't have to be long, it's just like 30 seconds speech, three or four sentences. Okay, and I'm going to give you five minutes. Has, it, has everyone got something that they can, they can ramble about for two seconds? No, not the moment, not quite. Okay, then you're, you're last, so work quickly. Um, can everyone else come, come sit down and we'll, we'll go from the front to the back? Because <laughs> I don't like <laughs> So, what were you guys again? Twitter for schools. Do you want to stand up and, and give the... Who's got the elevator pitch? Yeah, you're marketing now. So you're um, right, Twitter for schools. Um, it's essentially Twitter, and it uses the Twitter platform, but it's made safe for schools, so that pupils within a school can use Twitter um, safely, which means it's there's different aspects to that, but the first aspect is filtering and kind of making a walled garden. So there's multiple levels, so you can limit the tweets only within the class, or within the school, or within a group of schools, or within a kind of a, 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 a predefined set of other people. <coughs> um, also, monitoring features so the teacher can actually see what's going on, and regulate and remove, and all the rest of it. So essentially, it's a safe social space for students. Excellent. Next. 
got nominated. So. <laughs> That's what you get when you uh, come up with ideas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, ours is um, what was it? banking for Facebook. Facebook for banking. We're a social network that caters to the, the top 1% bankers. <laughs> an exclusive platform for, telling, for, for the 1% to tell each other about what they really care about, which is money. <laughs> um, and that's, I think that's cool. about it. <laughs> oh, the domain name. What was the domain name? How big's my bonus? How big's my bonus.com. <laughs> <laughs> Next! <laughs> um, yeah, we are um, Paymentology, so payment for hospitals, um, easing the pain of payment on the new private size health system. <laughs> <laughs> you can, for example, you can uh, make sort of sliding scale payments to reduce your wait time. Um, micro payment throughout the systems for things like your TV in hospital, your phone, your treatment, um, crowdfunding for your operation, um, <laughs> even, even a donate button for, for your organs. So, <laughs> with our system, everyone can afford some kind of treatment. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Okay, so um, we had YouTube procedures. Um, with the name Silver Surfers. Um, the idea is to, to have it as a, a place where seniors can share their experiences, their video content about what they're doing, get people out there armchair and interacting with their peers, with the world and the old people sat around, um, but making it accessible, not intimidating because there are barriers to access it, um, and also making the content appropriate. So, yeah, I think lots of comedy videos. Of I don't know, whatever youth content that might just block up the noise, it's relevant content they can find. Um, that's pretty much as far as we go. That's good. Thanks. We had um, eBay for hotels. We uh, kind of argued a little bit about whether, uh, about the definition of that, was it? Were you buying hotels? Were you bidding for hotels themselves, uh, as in you know, buildings? Or, or was it eBay for hotel owners where you could buy cut <coughs> and, and, and things? But we decided that the, the easiest thing to do probably would be to, to go with something that exists already. So that was a consumer-facing auction site for hotel rooms, so for reservations. Okay. So because there are two, two quick um, scenarios. One, a sporting event's coming up, so hotel owners will list their rooms and then get the best price for them because everybody's fighting over the, over the hotel rooms that are there. The other scenario was you've got empty rooms anyway, so list them, some cash is better than no cash, you've got an empty room. I think that was there already. So. And, that, and it was East Day. East Day. So your yeah. first scenario is a rich win. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got the really interesting Google for Banks. Uh, so we said a search engine for ethical banks to discover uh, information on financial trends, market analysis, and even legal advice. Should they ever think that? <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Right. Carry on pondering those. Now, now you've got more fixed on sale. Um, my experience in startup land um, in the 90s was that there was, there was somebody who had an idea like that and thought it was good enough to succeed. And then they just ran with it. Well, they, what their focus on was to get the money to build. Um, so they produced you know, a business plan and a finance model um, to convince <laughs> investors to give you the appropriate money. Uh, and then they went and built it, and then pretty much always, in my experience, it failed miserably. Um, the interesting question to me is, is where the UX is in this? In my experience back then, it was, like, it, it was almost nowhere at the start. There was almost no kind of user research and stuff involved. It was mostly in kind of the interaction design and the UI design and the visual design of the product that was being built. There wasn't much said in art, figuring out whether it was sane to build the product that had been asked for in the first place. Move forward a little bit. Um, I was hugely disillusioned um, with software at this point uh, because I had spent six months with a client going backwards and forwards over a requirements document, um, which included this big ass database design schema thing. 
Is that, is that a swear word? Yeah. The dog was cute. <laughs> you don't live with the dog. <laughs> We'd, we'd spent some time on an, an over-large requirements <laughs> with uh, an extensive database spec. We had literally spent six months going backwards and forward. We were based in, I was based in Brighton at this company at that point. The client was in London. Every like week and a half, we went backwards and forwards. They come down to, uh, you know, oh, you need to do this. Oh, you need to do that. Yeah, da, 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 da. Eventually, we had to sign off. Man, <laughs> Sugar. Sugar, sugar, sugar. Um, finally, we had sign off, which was greatly appreciated by all in the company. <laughs> and we started, but, and literally two weeks later, we basically threw it away. Because all it needed was two weeks of building stuff, building wireframes, getting a little bit of interaction design there so they could see how it works. And suddenly it was. Oh, we had this like one comment field that had this complicated workflow about. You know, so we had several comment fields that had this complicated editorial workflow around. Can this just be one big text box that everyone can type in? You know, and suddenly six months of my work was thrown away. And the stuff that we did build in the end didn't actually work that well. There were lots of bugs, lots of functionality, and I was I was seriously at this point considering I've had enough of software. It's tedious and, and it wastes a lot of my time. And I was Googling around then, and this was 1999, I found C2 Wiki, I found um, descriptions of extreme programming, um, and started getting into more of kind of what later became Agile. This is um, the, the Snowbird place where the Agile Manifesto was signed, um, which we all know and love. And The thing that I, I love about, I mean, I love the values, you know, that, that my best experience was we're all with small teams that work together, and that reflected that. Um, having software that actually worked was, was, was good, as far as I was concerned. Um, having proper customer collaboration would, would seem to solve a, lo a lot of problems, and um, we were always having changing requirements and, and changing motivations for things. So responding to that was a good idea. Um, initially, I have to admit, when I read the CTV and looked at the extreme um, XP practices, I thought they were complete rubbish. I would never work in a million years. Um, unfor uh, fortunately for me, smart people continued to say that they did work and slapped me around the back of the head until I saw that too. Um, and I started building working software more successfully, which helped with the kind of the latter half of that problem, the fact that we could come up with this, you know, the spec might change, but once we started building things, we could build things in a good and reliable way. Um, it didn't solve the other half of the problem, was that we built something that worked really, really well and nicely, and everyone agreed that, you know, the customer agreed that this is what they asked for and they were happy with it, but when we released it to the rest of the world, nobody still used it. Which again, was a pain. 2006. This guy, Steve Blank. Um, who's heard of Steve Blank? Yay! Um, Steve Blank's a, ser a serial entrepreneur. Um, ran several successful companies. He's come from like a mostly a techie background. Um, and, you know, he retired with his big pile of cash from his IPOs and so forth. And, you know, went off to the hills to write his memoirs. Um, his family told him that his memoirs were incredibly boring and no one would be interested in them. So he went to teach entrepreneurship at Stanford instead. And what he did then was kind of retroactively look at the startups that had worked and the startups that hadn't worked in kind of the dot com boom. And he saw patterns. And those patterns were the, the successful ones were very responsive to change. They, they might have had an original direction going one place, but if that didn't work, they changed and went somewhere else. Um, and he came up with this definition of, of startup. And the operative word here is, is search. You know, it's looking for a business model, looking for a business model that works and is repeatable and can actually build a business around. It's not focused on having that one idea that works. 
It's focused on looking for an idea that works. And he articulated this in a thing that he called customer development, which had kind of four, kind of two phases really. The, the first half is looking for that business model. It's the search bit. And the first part of that is discovering customers. He, he was the one who popularized the phrase, get out of the building. You know, leave the office where you are, go talk to your customers face to face. You know, understand their pain points, understand their problems. Um, and that will lead you to thinking, oh, I can solve that product. Yeah, I can solve those problems with this kind of solution. And then you can present that solution to them and, and see if it works. So the first part of it is not so much, it's not focused on um, building the product and planning this fully defined idea. It, it's, it's focused on two things. It's coming up with a problem um, and finding a solution to that problem. And you find that problem by going and talking to your customers. After you've done that, you move over to customer validation. So you've got this idea of a product, you've got this solution. Then is there actually a market for that? You know, are there enough people there to build a business around? You know, so we can try and look out and, and check that there are enough people with this problem to actually build a proper business around. You can build prototypes, you can go out and try and sell the solution before you've built it. And if it, turns out, um, if it turns out that there isn't a big enough market, you go back and pivot. And pivot is one of those words like refactoring, um, which gets terribly abused. In the same way that refactoring isn't just changing everything that you started with into something else. Pivoting is not just throwing away your old idea and starting a new one. Pivoting, and I'm, I'm fairly obviously a sport person, but... Um, comes from the basketball thing where you have one foot planted and, and you move, move the rest of your, your body around. You're using, using what you've learned already and changing kind of one or two things. So um, one of the canonical examples of this is there was this um, company in the 90s that had a kind of started doing a massively multiplier, a massively multiplayer game. Um, and it had this thing that you could upload your own images to it. And when they looked at it, they found that, and that was their original idea, um, when they looked at what people were doing, they found out that people were uploading pictures of their dogs and their kids and their parents, because it was an easy way to show other people that. Um, and they thought, hmm, that, that seems more popular than that's, that, that, let's change to focus on that. So they used their learning specs on that, and that's what became Flickr in the end. You know, Flickr started as a game, ended up being a photo sharing site. Um, PayPal started off with an idea of being a, a payment system for kind of dumb phones. You know, better just mobile phones at that point because we didn't have smartphones. But, you know, that's where it started. And it turned into kind of, you know, the web payment system for eBay and all that stuff. And it's kind of ironic they're getting back into mobile payments, which is where they started from. Again, using, 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 using going around this loop, learning stuff until you have a model that, that works and then you move to customer creation. So this, this is kind of execution and scaling. So at this point, you're using what you've learned. You're, you've, you've now got what they call um, market fit, and you can then use all you've learned to start throwing money at this model that you know works to scale it up, and then you start building a normal kind of company. So this is all about search, finding that problem. This is all about kind of scaling that validated solution up. A metaphor I sometimes use is, is to kind of compare the two models is the, the dot-com model in the 90s that often that failed miserably was, was kind of like going, going out in the street, seeing someone you find attractive, and at that point, booking the church, hiring the registration firm and the limo, uh, you know, telling your parents, and then going to talk to them and see if you like them. Um, the customer development is, you know, you go for coffee and donut first. Another metaphor is, is plans versus maps. And a lot of the problem with that old sort of model is in that kind of word business plan. It's, it feels like this is what going to ha is going to happen, like an architectural plan is going to be what the building turns out at, at the end. Whereas what you're really doing in the customer is, is you're exploring. 
you don't draw the map of the new territory that you're exploring before you explore it. It's something you, you draw as you go. It's, it's a kind of a learning thing. It's, it's a discovery thing, not a this is how the world is going to be thing. Again, where is UX? Now, Steve Blang wrote up his lecture notes around this model in a book called Four Steps to the Epiphany, which I find very hard to say. So I'm quite pleased that did it well then. <laughs> And in some respects, it's a god awful book um, because it's um, it really, really needs a technical editor of some kind. Um, uh, it's just kind of you know the bound notes in a, in a thing. But and when I first read it, wearing my UX hat, I was thinking, you go and talk to your customers to find out what your problems are. Well, what a shock! You know, this is what UX people user researchers have been saying that we should be doing forever. You know, this is the old stuff, retread, there is nothing new to learn here. And then I read it again because one of the problems that the UX profession has is convincing other people that this is a good idea, that talking to customers and understanding the problem is something that is going to get you value at the end of it. And that's what Steve Blank did with that customer development model. He communicated the value of understanding users, understanding their problems to the business world, which is something we have really failed, you know, we in the kind of little community of practice of UX people have really kind of failed to do in many ways. So I think to some extent the fact that, and there's a whole bunch of stuff if you read that book with the UX hat, you go, that's a really bad way to do user interviews. You know, it's, it's, it comes to it from a very sales approach with kind of um, the kind of leading questions which you would avoid in a, in a, if you had more skill in that area. But the fact that this is, you know, Steve Blank isn't a dumb person, he's a very smart person, he made a lot of money. Um, but the fact he, he wrote an entire book about this model without kind of talking about user research as a thing tells us that there is a lot of value there but our community isn't communicating that, hey, we do this and we do it quite well, very well. So that's something I found quite interesting about customer development. A bit later on, 2008, this guy, Eric Reese, scary photo I know. Um, start talking about Lean Startup. Eric was a student of Steve Blanks at Stanford, and he took while the customer development model is, is, a, is a nice way to think about business models and how you <coughs> approach creating the business, there's not a lot of kind of grim and gritty advice on how you actually do that. And Steve, um, Eric Ries came up with what became known as the Lean Startup model, which was to build, build us around the kind of the, the scientific method. You know, as, as much as you can do for something as fuzzy as this. You know, you come up with a hypothesis about how you think your business works or how you think the features work in your product. You then look for ex an experiment that you can build to discover whether that hypothesis is true or not. You run the experiment and then you know. And then you repeat that. So, no, so if, if you think that you know, your customers kind of want to buy shoes every two weeks, then you find an experiment to figure out whether they do want to buy shoes every two weeks, whether it's a kind of mock-up or talking to your customers or whatever. And then you can use that learning for the next time around the loop. And this is, um, you know, and science is good. That's, that's, the, mod that's, that's the model that, he, that is sold to the world in Lean Startup, that it's, it's kind of, you know, very repeatable and very obvious, and it also kind of works along a number of different scales. And it's usually presented in this, this kind of loop, which is kind of a misnomer, because it, it's, it's pretty you know, you come up with an idea, um, you build just enough to find out whether it's true, you collect the data, you learn something, you go around, but really you go around it the other way. You start off here. You start off with, I want to learn this thing, and then you go, 
what do I need to know? What's the littlest I need to know to figure out whether that thing is true or false? Okay, what would I need to measure to find that out? What's, what's the smallest thing I need to build to find out whether that thing is true? So you kind of, you go around that way, but your learning goes around that way. And this is, if you think, if you think of product certainty and market certainty along kind of, you know, yeah, you four quadrant grid. Um, you know, at this, at this end, I have no idea what I'm building. And at this end, I'm 100% sure of what I'm building. And at this end, I have no clue what my market is. And up here, I'm 100% sure what my market is. And you see, if you think about it this way, you see kind of old startups have a couple of different patterns. There's, there's down here, which is you have no clue what you're building it and no clue what you're building it for, which is just a horrible place to be. Um, engineers, wearing my, my developer hat, we often end up kind of over here. Um, we know what we're going to build. We're 100% sure what we're going to build. Um, and then we're kind of not really sure who we're going to deliver it to. The number of times the question I get is kind of, we're just about to launch. How do I get customers? <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is kind of a, a terrible thing to have. Sometimes you get people who are 100% sure of their market, um, but don't really know what they want to build. They're, they're kind of, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, there are lots of teenagers into music. We'll build something around teenagers and, and music, and the actual kind of product here just kind of flails around. We had one client in the 90s who I won't name because they're famous. Basically, um, <laughs> basically Snapchat, right? Sorry? Basically Snapchat. Um, yeah, I guess, but the, you know, Snapchat fails more often than it succeeds, and and to some extent, it was very, uh, it was obvious. Actually, no, Snapchat isn't an example because it was obvious really early that there was a. They might have kind of had a brief period over here. With this, we think this is useful, but they even, you know, they built it because they had an immediate need, and then they saw very quickly after that that lots of other people wanted this too. You know, so they didn't, you know, they 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 could find that. But we, we, had a, we had a customer in the 90s who literally, they had their broad market area, right? Which was kind of fairly well off city women, fashion and cosmetics type stuff. You know, uh, as in the kind of people who spend like 200 quid on face cream, those sorts of, rather than kind of Tesco happy shoppers. And, you know, one month we went up and it's gonna be we're going to get it all through sponsorship. And the next time they went up, it was kind of, we're going to get all our, all our markets through selling demographic information. And the next time it went up, it's kind of, we're going to get all our money by kind of taking a slice of the profits. And so, yeah, it's like they had a different business model, a different kind of group of users that they were targeting in two ends of their, their, their two-sided market. And we burned through literally millions of VC money on that project because it changed every year eight weeks because they didn't really have a good way of discovering where to go. And up here, that's where the value is. Not necessarily money, it doesn't have to, you know, this, this works for non-money oriented things as well, but whatever you value is up in that corner. You know what your product is, you know what your market is, and then you can fill that. And basically Lean Startup is all moving from there to there as quickly as you can, you know, by using the experiments that you run to validate whether you know, this market is correct or what, or that kind of product idea works or not. So it's investing less, moving around this loop as quickly as possible to learn the things you need to move up to here. So, another way of summarizing these stuff, so, which is a common one, is kind of these three things thrown together. It's continual delivery and deployment because you have to push things out on a regular basis to, to do those experiments, to learn from the things that you build. Um, you need customer development because that's all about discovering that kind of product market fit. And you need Agile because Agile rocks for doing those things, for building iteratively, changing quickly, embracing change, all that sort of stuff. So you can throw those things together and that's kind of where Lean Startup sits. A couple of examples. Um, everyone knows who Zappos is, hopefully, yes. Um, this is from Eric Reese's Link Startups book, you know, big ass company. Um, ask is loud. <coughs> wasn't last time. No, it wasn't last time. <sighs> Sugar. <laughs> 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 
Go for him in this game. Uh, Get another dog in this race. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst I've done in ages. Um, now, in do um, fine too high, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, it's meant to be uh, a disincentive. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's meant for this not to happen. Uh, <laughs> now. We've got an F that can help you. Sorry? We've got an F idea that can help you. <laughs> um, what are we talking about? Yes, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Their idea, selling shoes, great customer service, design shoes, all that sort of thing. The old dot com model would kind of, you know, would be okay. We're building this thing. Let's get lots of money because we need to have, you know, relationships with all the designer shoes companies. We need to figure out what things we're going to buy. We need a warehouse to put it in. We need a, we need a large website to kind of sell all this. We need to design an e-commerce system, a checkout system. We need to arrange delivery and all this kind of stuff. Or we need a sales force to sell this thing. Um, we need a large development team to build all this stuff, and we need customer support to manage it. And that's going to need n million pounds or dollars, whatever. Let's go find some investors. Instead, this is what the founder did. He went round his local shoe shops and said, "I'm going to try and sell your shoes online. Do you mind if I take photos of your shoes? And if, if anyone wants to buy it, I'll come back and buy your shoes." The shoe shops went fine. He took those photos and basically put them up on a blog. You know, something close to a blog. At that level of kind of development time. Sold some shoes, went to the shoe shop, bought the shoes, delivered them off. Which was enough for him to learn about demand. It was enough for him to learn about the kind of customers that were coming to him. It was enough for him to learn that customer support was key. It was enough to give him enough confidence to then go build a little bit more, learn a little bit more, spend a little bit more money, um, without it going horribly, horribly wrong. At the other end of the scale, you can use it at kind of the feature level. We have this client um, who was convinced that adding SEO login, sorry, um, social media login to their system would um, increase registrations because lots of people were dropping out of the registration process. Um, and this person was basically the CEO. Everybody else thought that this was a rubbish idea. Now, normally you know how that conversation works. CEO wins and you build the feature. And it would have been a week, two weeks of built, you know, build and release if we're going to get all the kind of edge cases dealt with. Which should have been a bunch of, you know, a bunch of cash. Instead, because fortunately everyone, including the CEO, had bought into this more experimental model. All we did was, on the registration page, we had a, a register with Twitter link, and that link went to the registration page with the bit at the top that said, sorry, social media login, the registration not working quite now. Which took about an hour and a half. And then we released that and looked to see who clicked on that. Um, and very, very, very few people did click on that. Um, so we just took the link away and went on with the rest of our work rather than wasting two weeks of time, rather than wasting that half-day meeting of shouting, kind of politely shouting at the CEO and telling them that their idea is rubbish. Um, you know, so it's not only saving the development time, it's saving the angst and meeting time of making that decision on whether to build or not, and turning it into a very small, very cheap experiment. So, back to your startup ideas briefly. Um, what I'd like you to do for the next five minutes is start thinking around your startup idea, around that little elevator pitch, um, try and come up with as hypothesis that you need to, or assumptions in your model about what you need to find out, whether it be about kind of whether people want this, whether there's whether, whether there are any kind of people in this area anyway. That sort of thing. So all we're after right now is the assumptions and the questions. Um, and if you can try and write, um, there should hopefully be enough post in this round. Try, try and write kind of one per post-it sort of thing. Feel free to discuss amongst yourselves if you like, and just do that for five minutes. If, does anyone need sharpies? You should all have a sharpie in your bag, um, in your conference bag. If not, I have I have sharpies at the front. <laughs> Thank you.
search engines. That's, okay. We think they want to know about their industry. Okay. Um, it would be good while um, everyone else is reading theirs out. If any of those spark off other hypotheses, write them down. Because uh, you, you'll need more than one for that. Uh, or it'll be useful if you have more than that one. Um, next then. Uh, yeah, I suppose the eBay for hotels. Um, we had a number of hypotheses we need to test. One was that customers would be willing to accept the uncertainty while they're waiting for the, for the auction to end. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's joined the customers who would be willing to wait when they're purchasing a room, as in not just purchasing it yep. immediately. Um, hotel owners would be willing to accept the risk of a variable return on the room, and hotels have empty periods when they need to fill the rooms cool. and they'll be willing to. Next. And read to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so ours is YouTube for seniors. Uh -huh. And it's the first one that. Um, we're assuming seniors aren't tech savvy, so what we need to build is something which is going mm -hmm. to be engage, engageable with them. Um, seniors want to interact and meet new people. Um, seniors can't access the technology. Um, that's, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Um, so we had PayPal for hospitals. We focused on um, just the, the jumping queues by, by micropayments uh, as you were there. Um, so there are a few things um, that our customers have smartphones, um, that there's signal um, that people are actually willing to pay to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just pick out a couple. Uh, bankers care what the 99% think. Um, and bankers want new ways to show off material wealth that they haven't already got, like buying Ferraris. Excellent. <laughs> this is really interesting because I'm guessing, I'm guessing that none of you are hugely empathic towards this, this user group. <laughs> I am actually, I'm after that. This is a market, is a market that I'm after, that <laughs> This is really interesting of things that, that this kind of exercise can sometimes make you feel that you actually don't want to do the work and that can become almost an assumption in and of itself of do we want to carry on exploring this, Are we, does this make us passionate, does this help us, but that's, that's a kind of an aside, sorry. And um, you guys? We were at um, Twitter for schools mm -hmm. and we had a, a handful of um, children will actually use it, um, the, someone will pay for, pay for this. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, schools won't accept advertising, so it's too kind of being linked. Um, and uh, that there's actually anything wrong with Twitter at the moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, those are interesting. Did anyone notice something in common about most of those? No guesses? Sorry? I think they're cynical. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them were cynical. Some of them were cynical, were cynical in a good way. Um, most of them were about people. They were about what kind of the customers, whether it be you know the bankers or the seniors or the school children. I mean, some of them were around infrastructure, some of them were around technology, some of them, some of them were around things, but most of the questions were around the people. Which kind of leads with, the next one is, is, is where the UX is going. And, you know, 
early on in the Lean Startup movement that there, there wasn't a lot of talk about kind of UX people as a profession and there was a lot more of kind of you just kind of iterate towards the product by you know, build, you know doing a bit of increments you can talk to some customers try and sell to them and stuff like that. There weren't a lot of things from the UX toolkit in there. And the metaphor in some is, is the fact it's, it's kind of um, for folks who remember the early Agile movement, um, I mean, we, there, there was a time where it was quite, um, the lone tester at the back of my room, um, it, there was a, a time where it was quite hostile to testers as a profession. There was the idea that now all the developers are doing TDD, we're, we're kind of releasing every week so we know what doesn't work, um, why do we need this, this separate person as, you know, to do, do testing or be involved in testing, everyone does testing. Later on, people could see um, when things continue to go horribly wrong um, that there, there's real value in testers as a profession. They, they have a specific skill set. Um, they spot things and have an attitude to breaking things um, that developers often don't have. So there's real value in that. Even if they're not doing more testing, they go out and help facilitate um, other people in the team to do better testing. Um, they can help spread that mindset and understanding among the whole team. So there really is a role for good testers in Agile teams, but the, the way they work changes quite a bit. And that for me is, is almost the same kind of thing for, for UX. You know, it's, it's, there's this model in Agile of kind of we, we are you know, delivering frequently, um, so we learn when things don't work quite quickly, we have embedded customers, or hopefully we did, um, we, we learn from them directly. Why do we need this other UX? profession in there um, and the same from the Lean Startup stuff and it's because they um, have a slightly different mindset, they have a whole other toolkit of things that you can use to help find and discover things and that leads us to where Lean UX came in. So it's not really a, a whole separate new thing, it's kind of another layer on top of all the other things that we're talking about. Um, Janice Fraser, who was um, ex of Adaptive Path, now works for Luxor, in fact, now works for Pivotal. Um, I need to go back my slides. <laughs> um, this, this was one of her very earliest blog posts on the topic. Um, and here she talks about Lean UX, not, not as a kind of, you know, a separate thing. It's like, how do we do UX work in this kind of Lean Startup environment? What different practices and approaches do we need to use to do good UX work in this very iterative, questioning, learning-driven process, rather than the much more traditional kind of we go off and do all the research first and tell you what to build type model. And really the, the, often word, the, the word there to focus on is lean. You know, back from the toy to, to age of production speed. In fact, hand, who knows where kind of lean, lean came from as a, as a thing? Oh, good. This, this, is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, at the more, um, I do this workshop with different kind of groups of people. And when you, when you talk to more kind of project manager UX people, there tends to be less understanding of where that, that origin comes from. So I'll, I'll quickly skip over this. But, you know, the total production team, the gap lean manufacturing, lean thinking, lean whatever, lean accounting, there's lean hospitals, there's all these sort of things. Um, and amongst other things, it was about designing out these things, designing out kind of, you know, having too much work to do, designing out kind of inconsistent flow within the organisation, designing out waste. And again, that word waste was often misinterpreted. You know, it's not about kind of throwing things away or cutting things to the bone. It's about designing out things like kind of, you know, you know, if we build too many things and they're not bought, you know, overproduction, that's waste. If we um, are sitting around waiting for a part to arrive, you know, or uh, a thing is sitting in a garage waiting to go out, then that's waste. If we are having to ship things around from different bits of the factory, and, you know, the part that you need isn't right there next to you, then that's waste. Um, if we can find out a better way of hanging a car door or fixing a brake or whatever, then, you know, that's waste. If we have this massive warehouse, you know, full of car doors, you know, then we've got all the 
the money about you know, the time and money to kind of own that warehouse and maintain that warehouse and make sure that there's a big pile of car doors in there. We're really only we need the next car door for the next car. That's waste. Um, that's the kind of the ergonomic waste of you know are we moving in the most efficient way within the factory? Um, there's kind of the building things that don't work. You know, there's the, there's the making defective products. That's waste. It's not so. It's not about cutting things to the bone. You know, it's not about low quality, it's not about making things quickly. Um, it's not about necessarily doing things cheaply. Um, it's, it's very definitely not about no deliverables, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's about doing things efficiently, without waste, as... as, as um, if, you t if you talk to, uh, and, I, and I am not a poetic person, uh, but I t I've talked to some people from Toyota in the past, and, and they wax lyrical about it in a very um, emotional way. You know, we're doing it elegantly, almost. You know, those, those are more the kind of words that are used. You know, so the kind of the adoption, I think, of the word lean over here for that sort of stuff is very... Um, we have connotations for that word that aren't really in that mindset. So I think we'll... Would you say we look at it in a more analytical, process-driven way than in a kind of a, an emotional, philosophical way? Indeed. And I think as well we've had various people have had things like kind of Lean Six Sigma has, has an approach to doing that stuff. And a lot of people's uh, first encounter with Lean Ideas is through, um, I can't think of a polite way of saying this, kind of some, somewhat over-enthusiastic application of Lean Six Sigma principles where you are you know looking for any possible way to pinch a penny rather than create more value overall over the, the kind of the entire spread of your business so I want to do a brief exercise now I know these are manufacturing metaphors but they're just ideas to give you different things because there are things like kind of you know we build features that you know one of the ways the software wastes things, you know, we build filters that no one needs, we wait for other people to deliver us requirements or cut, sign off on things. Um, you know, we are, you know, we build things without TDD and which take, you know, much longer to bug fix afterwards, we, you know, we deliver bugs. You know, all those, there, there are kind of metaphors to this, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to follow this religiously. But what I'd like people to do just for a couple of, um, yeah, just for five minutes, is to think about instances of waste in their existing workflow in the way you build products okay so just like things again delivering bugs wait waiting for other people to do requirements waiting for sign off all those sort of things i just spent five minutes to get a few examples of those Okay, I'd normally get you to a finicky diagram and this sort of stuff, but we're running a little over time. So, if we can just get a couple of examples um, from. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> from the dozen. <laughs> <me. laughs> we have um, the canvas of waste that for us are. Actually, just as a thing, if, if, anyone, if anyone else has something like that or has experienced something like that after you read one out, Everyone stick their hand up who's, who's had that. Cheer. Yeah. Okay, Ooh. okay, yeah. I'll cry. <laughs> Me too. It's like a support yeah. rip, eh? Yeah. Um, Just do two. If, do. I, if I swear, do you have to No, pay no. <laughs> and you don't have to pay either, so you're allowed to swear. Okay, so I'll give you a two of them. We've got things like um, rework and specialisation. That's never happened to anyone else. <laughs> well, you for real? Never happened. <laughs> And what's the second one? Yeah, specialization. So silos and specialization. Well, that, that, that's a description. What's the waste that happens because of that? Um, it's in the kind of contractual relationships between them and the sign off. So okay, so kind of managing the, 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 the yeah. flow of information. Yeah. Sort of yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, there's a coordination cost. That's the main waste in silos. Communication overhead to make sure everybody understands what they're doing. Okay. Or just, uh, just Very just simply put, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, someone, someone from the the second row. Um, 
<laughs> so we have, um, sometimes we do designs for screens and we don't develop them soon enough, so they sort of hang around and then by the time we're screen, <laughs> it's like... Oh yeah! <laughs> um, and also we, we, can, we tend to have releases every sort of six weeks, and so we have a conversation at the beginning and then like, we forget the conversation and we end up having it again, <laughs> like four weeks down the track with a different decision coming at the end. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So, I guess, a couple people from the next row. Um, yeah, we've got, um, we've got uh, kind of over engineering scenarios or building things you might never use. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then delays around kind of decisions, we had a couple of related ones, like decisions by committee and, and waiting for funding approval. To so that's, that's kind of waiting for people to, to come yeah. back with information. Okay. Next row. Uh, not maintaining utility tools that developers use every day. <coughs> so stuff gets out of date and then the new developer starts and then they try and use the tools and they don't work. So it's kind of the, the setup process and, mm -hmm. and getting people started is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else on that right? um, So producing artwork that doesn't get used when clients insist to do like two or three versions of, of a homepage design or something. <laughs> <laughs> Might not necessarily be waste because that's information discovery, finding what they want. Only if you're doing it with users, not if you're doing it with clients. As well, I think that's mm. right. this is actually an, an interesting point. Um, there, there's again, this is something that's kind of hard to come over in a translation from the stuff that was written. It's like kind of waste is not necessarily something that can always go away. Yeah. There is this concept of, and you, you hear the phrase in these like necessary waste. You know, you can't always make it go away. So it might <coughs> still be kind of useful, but it still doesn't deliver, help the end product be delivered, as it were. Um, have we had two? Yes, we've had two from you. Okay, someone from the, this room? I think um, one that we talked about, because I'm managing a startup and Andy's actually the developer, so it's quite good. <laughs> so I just turned to, I turned speak, to my left. Speak left cathartic, hasn't it? Exactly. I was like, where have I wasted your time? So, um, so um, actually, the big thing was that I think, because I was so new to Agile, I needed everything in the backlog estimated. I needed to know where we were going to be in four months' time. Da, 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 da. Now, I did a backlog a couple of days ago, and it's the briefest sort of just very brief realistic tasks that we can move around and we can change around and I think Andy just can spend too much time estimating things at my request. And, and, <laughs> and actually it changed by the time we got to that task because of the work we've just yeah. done, it had changed. So yeah. there's just no point in doing it. So now it's literally we write the task, yeah. we don't write anything else. And when we get to that task, that's when we... So it's kind it. of estimating work that, and then that. There's no value in that estimation. No, because it becomes redundant with time. Okay. Everything becomes redundant. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, another one from Laura? We had um, writing workarounds for, for problems that are built into systems, so writing documentation on workarounds. Oh, that's a classic. <laughs> oh, that's the kind of, this, this as a general, kind of, if you don't have a UX person, and you haven't got user testing, which you should, you, sorry, usability testing, which you should start as soon as you can. But in the meantime, go talk to your technical authors, because they will tell you all the complete rubbish things in the system that you have had to document and explain to customers again and again and again. Um, and they would much rather not spend that time trying to make this insane workflow sound sensible and understandable. They would rather you make it sane in the first place. Um, so they're really useful people to talk to. That technical author nodding in the corner. Yes. <laughs> okay, one from this way. Um, building the wrong thing. So basically, you know, no. going off. And just building no. um, another one we had was waiting for perfection. So basically, just trying to get it absolutely perfect before you release it and actually never release it. Well, I think it's obvious that these are not uncommon issues, um, and yet they still keep happening again and again. Um, these are all the kind of topics that come up again and again and again. I think we've covered a lot of these already. Um, I think ownership is probably one we've not mentioned, but it's kind of you know the, the fact that, that kind of one person owns the decision, but needs to involve someone else, and sometimes that person thinks they own the decision, and it's a big argument. People get told different things and stuff like that. Uh, communication we've covered, 
uh, understanding customers we've covered. Understanding the business is an interesting one. I off, one of the one of the ones that pops up in your business is, is you you actually have conversations with different parts of the company, and they actually have different ideas of how the business works and where the money comes from. You know, one person thinks most of the money comes from support contracts. The other person thinks most of the money comes from developing custom features. One person thinks most of the money comes from kind of ongoing monthly um, renewals and things like that. And because they have these different understandings, they're, they're building things and, and creating features with different motivations. What's alignment? Um, alignment is, is, is people having this kind of, kind of that in the more general case of kind of people having different ideas in their head about what, thing, what, what people are doing. So kind of like, one person's idea of you know that if you if you're building like a, a you know a, a web app for photographers you know one person has in their head kind of you know their granny managing the photos of the kids you know someone else in their head has kind of Pam who's a professional wedding photographer that they know and the other person in their head has that kind of the uh, the fact that they're going clubbing every other night and want to share photos of all these things with their friends and why they're all kind of person who wants to use a photo app. They all have very different motivations and very different understandings about how, what they would want out of that thing. So people end up prioritizing things very differently. So, part of, a big part of the motivation of this build measure learning is, is to try and cut down on that waste in various different ways, to try and look at those questions and assumptions you came up with earlier and finding the cheapest possible way of finding out whether that's true or not. So you don't end up building the wrong thing. You don't spend a lot of time communicating with those things. Um, some of you have probably heard the phrase MVP, which is the kind of the, the refer of that bit of the, of the graph. And I think this is actually one of the most confusing bits of, of, of naming in the lean startup world. In the, because it's not really product that you're building here. You are creating an experiment to validate your hypothesis. That might be a bit of product, but it also might be, like in the case of that Twitter login, that's just a link. And that's, that's all, that, all that link's purpose is to figure out whether people want to register with Twitter or not. It's not going to be in the final product if they do. Um, it's there to, to help find, that, find the information we need to know as quickly and cheaply as possible. You know, so rather than you know, building a first version, you know, it's, and please not everyone go away and think MVP equals like landing page, but you know, do Google Ads to find out whether people are searching for problems in this space. You know, that might be an initial experiment you know, at MVP to find out whether people are interested in this topic or going out and interviewing them or looking people going going doing usability testing on your current product to see if anyone has the problem that you think that they have. You know, all those kinds of things are kind of MVPs, they're experiments in that lean startup model. So how does lean UX compare to agile UX? You know, you often hear about UX in, in agile teams and the agile UX term is has is been around for a long time. And for me, the difference is between kind of product and learning. The focus of most Agile teams is, is building product. You, you, have some, you, have a custo you have an on-site customer, you have a product owner who has in their head, it's their job to understand business value and turn, turn that understanding into build this thing. And then the Agile teams are really good at kind of slicing that up, thinning it down into in nice increments of value and delivering that functional feature to the world. And so UX in an agile context, in that context, is all around making the product or service that you are delivering um, and that has already been decided and making that better with all the stuff in the UX talking. In the Lean Startup and UX world, we're all focused on the learning. So what, 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 how we judge progress in a Lean UX cycle isn't I have delivered another um, bit of business value to the end user. It is I have discovered something new. I have discovered whether this thing is true or false. That's, that's the thing that you're discovering. So it's not I have delivered a new feature. It's I have delivered this thing and it either works as I, you know, it does this thing that we thought it would do or it didn't do this thing that we thought it would do. And we 
we use that learning as the output to go back and drive the loop to the next thing. <coughs> Another brief exercise. This is a tool for one of the one of the common problems I get with people, and that is, is, is they think it's a very there's the experiment to find something out. And there is never the experiment. There are lots of different experiments that you could run. Um, like with that Twitter example, one experiment I could have run would be to just go talk to a customer, and, which might have actually been a better idea. Um, but, <laughs> I was going to say something more of those um, But this, this would have been, uh, uh, there, there were social issues involved as well. It would have been a harder sell for the because um, the CEO had basically read an article which overgeneralized how successful social media login was for registration, making registration better. Um, so I think one or two people saying that wasn't true wouldn't have convinced them. But you're right, Andrew. <laughs> you know, we could have just asked someone, which would have given us a certain level of confidence and a certain level of information. We could have do what we did, build a fake link, link see how many clicked on it. An equally valid way of learning, though it was pretty dumb, is we could have built the whole feature and see if anyone used it. That would have been, that would have told us 100% certain whether anyone was interested in it or not, but it had been very wasteful of time, time and resources. Each hypothesis that you have has multiple um, ways of finding that out. And there's this lovely um, canvas model that uh, David Blank came up with, which is you start off with kind of a focus, so it might be arc. Um, in the middle is something like um, like one of the, the, the Twitter for schools folk it might be kind of, you know, the, the, the central case is, you know, is this a problem at all? And then in each of these quadrants you have an assumption that's around that focus. So some of your, all, a bunch of your hypotheses are around that issue, does anyone care about this? And then in each quadrant for, um, for each assumption you try and come up with as many experiments as you can and you put them on this dimension. On, on this dimension, how long would it take to, do, to run this experiment? So fast, fast experiments go here, slow long experiments go here, or, you know. Um, and really, this one is often kind of time and expense as well. I, I kind of conflate the two. So it's kind of, if, it takes a long time, if it takes a long time or it costs a lot of money, it's up here. Um, if it's cheap and or fast, it's here. And this dimension is how, how confident you are the learning. Like, if I ask one person off the street, that gives me, a, if I ask a random person off the street, that gives me some information, a little bit of learning, but not a huge amount of confidence, because it's probably not my market, and there's only one person I've talked to. Whereas, if I build the entire feature, I'm 100% certain, or if anyone uses that, that that's, that's the issue, but it's an incredibly, ex um, um, but it is an incredibly expensive thing to do. So, Twitter link would be down here, building the whole feature and see if anyone uses it would be up there. Does that make sense? I've got one, one thing though that's floating around my head is where do you separate out though the real demand for it versus how effective your solution is at capturing that demand? So for example, putting a Twitter link, if that Twitter link doesn't have very much prominence on the page, people might just ignore it. Yeah. If it's the only thing that you could do, I could, I could skew the results to force everybody to go down the Twitter link and then just say, oh, but you could just sign up for another account. So that was kind of... That is, that's, that's a very good question. <clears throat> and is, to some extent, an entire other workshop <laughs> <laughs> uh, around the topic of, of kind of experiment design. Because there is that thing of how, how where, are, where are your biases? What are, the, what are the things that we want to measure? Um, the, the short answer is yes, you're right. That is an issue. Uh, and you need, you need to design your experiments in such a way that um, you are as unbiased as you can be. Um, the, other, the other most common problem I see with people is actually not setting a defined number on what is pass or fail. Um, so kind of, you know, you, the, the, the experiment is like kind of you know see if anyone clicks on this link and you never define on how many would be useful enough for you to go so then there's an argument well, eight people clicked on it that's, that's quite a lot I guess you know let's go anyway yeah. <laughs> to see how last for it mm -hmm. you know whereas with that you know we had a hard number of I think, I think we wanted an uplift of five percent on registrations using that thing and since it was like less than one percent clicked on it we knew we were never going to reach that number in a million years 
Um, and we did design a fairly prominent button at the top that, that made it obvious that, that was good. But you're completely right, that is, that is an issue. Uh, but it's just something that's a bit too complicated to go in to death. Right, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Um, I just have two questions. Right away. Question so one. the first one is um, about, I don't see where um, having a look at what the competition is doing fits into this. So mm -hmm. you might have a great product idea and you might like do all these tests or whatever, but your idea is linked to somebody else's idea where they've solved some problem. And where do you like, you know, where's that line where you say, well, they doing it and they're going to do it better anyway. This is going to cost you so much money, and we're going to be in competition with them if we, if we launch it at the same time. So, I mean, th those those are hard and interesting questions. Um, two different. Sorry, was that one question or two questions? That was my one question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, my two bits of answer then for that are uh, one. One of the good things that happens over having this more hypothesis driven approach is you actually start. It's easier to start thinking about those things. Um, and writing them down as this is this is this is a question for us to answer. It's not kind of we need to beat the competition. It's can we beat the competition? Or should we try and beat the competition? Um, the second part is that there are some experiments that you can run around that topic because there are things like okay, our competition has is is addressing this market. Is there assumption? Is there a small niche which they're addressing quite badly? You know. Is there a niche that we can address that would that they can't address because it would change the fundamental nature of their product? Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are questions that, like I was, it never actually, you know, there's an example of something that never went anywhere because they couldn't actually find a large market. But I, 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 I did some work with Startup at one point that was around kind of fitness and health and diet tracking. Um, but what they were targeting basically was that their, their kind of internal description of their custom was the people who don't go to the gym. You know, they are people like me. I, I need to lose weight. I know I need to lose weight. Um, I am not someone who goes to gyms and, and like or likes going to gyms um, or uh, has that intrinsic motivation to go be fit. So kind of that's what all the, the most all those fitness tracker sites are around that group of people who already know that they need to get fitter and kind of feel quite proud about having you know more steps or more stats than anywhere else. Whereas if you if you actually go and look at the, the market of the kind of people who go to Weight Watchers, for example, they don't talk about um, their things publicly. They talk about it in their little social circle, the meeting group, and stuff like that. So there's actually a different way of addressing that market from the photography type market because they're they're very different uses with different values. And so photography can't change to meet them because then it would abandon their existing users. Uh -huh. So the, the, there are things like that that you can address. Can I ask my second question? Okay. Sorry. Um, so the, I'll stop talking after this. The, the thing is, what I've found with um, product owners, in a, you know, when you come up with an, um, an idea, listening. the product owner is very stubborn about letting go of their original ideas once you do some validation. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. And that's one of the hardest things to do because what what this is 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 a mind is a mindset shift. It's like the kind of the agile mindset shift um, of we need to question everything, and um, that can be a hard. It's it's one of my last slides is one that just says reality cuts. <laughs> Some people find reality cuts, um, and. They find it very hard to change, and uh, I wish I had a magic button to make that happen, and a good, solid, this approach works well for me, but I don't. I do it on a case-by-case -case basis, and sometimes I fail. Um, uh, my favorite one is, um, those with a bit of paper start sketching that out for the talk. <laughs> um, my favorite example of that is, we worked with a, with a client who had a usage-based pricing model for their product. Okay? And as part of what we were doing, we went out and interviewed their most profitable clients. Okay? Now, as, as far as the CEO was concerned, their whole value, why people thought their product was great, it was fair pricing. You pay for what you use. Okay? 
We talk to their most profitable clients, the people who are order of magnitude more than kind of the 20% the that are order of magnitude above everyone else, the people who are getting the majority of their money. We talk to them, and basically, universally across the board, they said, the product's fantastic, it's really useful for the stuff that we do. The pricing model sucks, because for us, we have lots of different groups that do this thing, and we have auditing. Of, of our bills. So every time the bill for random amount that we've used comes in, we have to go check that that number's right. Which means talking to all these different departments, the number's coming back, and oh, the numbers differ, the numbers come back, oh, they're right this time. And the mistake is always then, it's never, never the bill. But because they have to go through that process, it costs them more money to figure out whether the bill is correct than the bill does. And one person actually said, add a zero to the bill and make it the same every month we would be happy, you know? So there was a group of customers that wanted to pay more, um, and we took this, feeling very pleased with ourselves, <laughs> to this action management, and they, they couldn't make them hear this message, because their, their mental model about the company was fair pricing, you pay for what you use. If we change that anyway, people are gonna think we're horrible and we're breaking our word. Um, and, you know, as far as I know this, I haven't worked with them for a while now, and as far as I know, they still have that old pricing model, despite there was not only money on the table, customers were actually asking for the, to, to give them more money. So, I, I don't, I wish I had a good answer to that, but I don't. Um, right, let's do this quickly. So, focus, pick a focus, or if you haven't got something obvious, just pick four of your hypothesis, and then try and come up with as many different experiments Okay, for each of those hypotheses. So it, it might be just talking to someone, it might be building, you know, you've got two easy ones for most of them. Talk to someone, build everything. Um, try and find some other ones in the middle. Okay, and we're just gonna, I'm just gonna find my timer. Okay, I'm gonna shut up. Actually, stop, because we haven't got enough time. Um, <laughs> Go play with this. Do this. Do this. Do this in your own time. This is your homework. Um, go do it. Did you get really in. Sorry. Sorry. Say again. The focus in the middle. What's the middle? That, that's just that kind of. Um, that's not the hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, it can be like a big hypothesis, and there are little hypotheses off it. Like, kind of, does anyone have problems using Twitter in schools? And then you might have three little things around that sort of thing. Um, and you get interested. Once you start, you kind of, you build, oh, we did that cheap here. Oh, we can do that over there as well. And, it, and it, you, you come up with lots of different ways of doing things. You, check, you find more and cheaper ways of doing things. But I've only got five minutes now, and I've run out of time, so I'm going to run through quickly some, some of the differences I see um, when doing UX in leaner contexts from non lean contexts. Interviewing. Traditionally, the way I was trained, the right way to do it, is you have special magic, well, special interviewers who are really well trained in it, and you go out by yourself, so sometimes you're hired in for a separate company. Um, you have this big complicated process. You figure out who you want to interview, you create a screening questionnaire, you talk to a, re a recruitment agency, arrange some dates, go meet those people, um, write it up the next week in this big long report. You need a nice presentation for that for the people who can't pay attention to the report. You need a showreel of interesting quotes for the people who can't pay attention to the presentation. Um, you deliver all that, and then at that point it sits on a shelf and no one uses it. Um, instead, doing things more like this. We have, um, we maybe go out with a, a trained interviewer and a kind of someone from the development team, or someone from sales, or someone from marketing who acts as an observer. Or if you're doing interviews on site, you have a whole bunch of observers in, in, you know, in the observation room. You have everybody noting down observations of the stuff that's recorded and sticking it on the wall. You have the whole team at the end of the day grouping those and figuring out what the most important issue is and then pushing that out onto the things we do tomorrow at best. So rather than kind of weeks or months of process for you to delivery, sometimes you are doing interviews, uh, you know, you do five interviews over a day you know, the next morning you do a big affinity diagramming and scheduling session and, the, you know, in that afternoon you are actually making changes based on what you learned. Persona. Have you come across Persona before? Okay, that's you. Good. So you know what it looks like. You know, pretty picture that describes and communicates <coughs> this 
metric shed load of user research that someone else has gone off and done. Mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of trust that this is correct because someone professional has produced it for you. Um, and these do a lot of different things. They help with alignment, they get everyone thinking about the same thing, they communicate with research, um, they help everybody empathise with the users. So I'm not saying persona are rubbish, um, but what can happen is that, like for example, I worked with a company that had these really great, well-researched, well-developed persona on mobile phone usage. Unfortunately, this research was done 18 months before the iPhone release, and it was now 18 months after the iPhone release, and the world had changed. Um, and all those uses of practical work. If, if you spend a lot of time researching somebody and then you do a market pivot somewhere else, that time's wasted. So instead we do much more lighter weight things. We might make something up, which is not what you're supposed to do with the persona, but as a starting point to get alignment, you just sketch something out really quick and dirty. You use this thing called empathy maps, and you divide... Um, this is a model. Things that come out of his head are thinking and feeling, things that are eyes you see, Things at the bottom of his mouth are things you say and do. Things at the ear are things you hear. Pain points, pains off the side, gain points. And those are a way to think about your users. And you might populate with this stuff from user interviews, or you might populate this stuff by having a big meeting with the salespeople and the product managers and the customer support and the technical authors, all the people who have contact with the customer can help populate this sort of thing. And again, it's a starting point. This is something that I've been doing with a few teams, and we start Rather than have this kind of abstract description, we start colour code, and th this is from a workshop, this is why we have some weird examples here, but we, we colour code and have a sort of Kanban chart for our, how well we understand the user. The green stuff is stuff we're 100% sure of. We, we have like, we've done 10 interviews and they've all said the same thing. We have this information from our product metrics that this, this thing is true, that every, you know, everyone is buying things between three and four o'clock on Thursdays. You know, and that's where they are. Um, the stuff in yellow is stuff we've got some evidence for, but we're not 100% on. We've, got, we've talked to a couple of people who have this. We've got some kind of weak evidence from how people use the product. Um, we've done a little bit of prototyping around this, and people have kind of said nice things, but not been hugely enthusiastic. And the red stuff is just stuff we made up. Um, and over time, you see, rather than having the static persona description, you have an ongoing model of how well we understand the customer. And over time, stuff moves from, as we go off and do user research, stuff moves from red to yellow to green. Um, when, we, when it comes to what do we build next, we can go look at, okay, there's this feature, which is mostly about customers and this uh, related to kind of our green bits. And we've got this other feature, which has mostly got red bits on. So we, we should probably build the green one and go do more research about the red stuff. Yeah, it's, an, it's another way to kind of communicate process and research, communicate our current understanding. Um, you know, these things are hypothesis about our customers that we're validating and understanding as we go on. Usability testing, much the same thing as the interview. You have this kind of, you know, you have the, you know, the nice labs, you go out and be a you know, screen questionnaire, recruitment, tests by, you know, by the experts. Um, Neglecting to say how much money that stuff normally costs as well. It's, a, it's money and time. Time is the biggest problem, not the money in my, in, in my view, because it, from the time from we need to do user testing to results delivered, it could be like eight weeks, months even, you know. Instead, sessions like this. This is a photo from um, a video that you can Google for, I know, links on there, that's from a write-up of it. This is a thing um, Redgate did is what they did is they set up a user research on their conference stand. They went to, went to one of the big Oracle conferences, um, they did interviews and paper prototyping and built some HTML mockups at the conference stand at the conference, which obviously has the people who are interested in their product, because it's the conference for those people. You know, so they, rather, rather, rather than doing all that, you know, sur you know, surveys and screen questionnaires, they went to where their users was rather than have a separate, well they did have expert, you know, um, Michelle here is a, is a great UX person, but they had other developers and other team members involved. If you want to read more about how to do quick and dirty usability testing, go buy that book. Um, design. That's the old model for design. It's the expert, it's the wonderful, knowledgeable person handcrafting the solution. Um, these days I'm doing much more stuff with whole teams. 
um, doing exercises like Design Studio, where you get groups of people to come up with ideas and critique those ideas and develop them on. Those, those can offer many different options that you can then go validate on whether they work or not. Documentation. Less pretty wireframe, more this. Um, because the point of the deliverable is to make something happen. Um, there's a, um, tools like Design Comics. This, this is a, an open source resource where you get lots of kind of pictures of people using computers that you can use to build storyboards in. Um, we use this tool quite a bit different places. I can't. It's called Comics. I can't remember what it's called. It's like, it's like Command CC, and then it finds it. So I can never remember what it's called. Um, but you can just take photographs and add little comic strips and balloons around it. So if you want to create this kind of storyboard of what happens, take a, you know, get a few people in the room to act it out, add the quote marks around it, and you can build you can build a little storyboard of stuff in like a couple of minutes, rather than having someone produce this wonderful handcrafted thing. There's this line about deliverables that, from Jeff Goffel, who wrote the, the lead, one of the Lean UX books. And I think this often gets misunderstood. People focus on the deliverables word. They read it as, we don't do documentation. But what it's actually saying is we're getting out of the deliverables business. Because a lot of UX and design folk, they get graded not on how great the product is, they get graded on how many wireframes they push out, how many mock-ups they put out. The, the, the thing that marks, I have done my job right, is I have delivered you the wireframe, I have delivered you the storyboard, I have delivered you the workflow. It's not, is that the right workflow? Does it actually make the product better in the end? Did the customers actually use it at the end? So it's moving from a business that's focused on deliverables to a focus of moving new experts to focus much more on the value that comes out the other end. So they need to focus on the whole team, not just their little bit of the workflow. And when I say that, it's my little bit of the workflow as well, because I've, I've done this as well. Yeah. On that last point? On that last point? Uh, how do you go about defining um, what the, the success would be? Because it's, obviously it's clearly easy to define success in terms of producing deliverables. But how do you say, uh, like, how do you measure that you, you clearly had the uh, intended outcome in terms of more people using the software, etc. Because more people have used the software. Yeah, but <laughs> level, compared to not having. Yeah. Um, split testing. Think. So you, you you have both options live at the same time. Um, you launch to a small group of people. I've learned. We are over time now. We're yeah. way up. Um, um, there's a session later on that I think is about this. Yes. In this track, actually, um, it's about testing designs. Um, yeah, that will be Melissa's to. MVP session. Uh, Melissa, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, do people want to run to lunch? Uh, this, this will be my quick summary. Is like in general, um, if you do less more often, you actually get more out at the end of it. UX research is often this big thing at the front, and then you do nothing else. Um, instead, do lots of research continuously, and it adds up to more value in the end. Thank you.